Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Well, I think it's time to define what is a, a definite integral and talk about its properties. Basically, we have prepared with all the... I think I had three different lectures dedicated to different examples of um, certain needs in mathematics and physics where um, we approach the same thing basically using the same methodology and came up with very very similar formulas and that's the justification for introducing just these particular kinds of um, calculations kind of formula uh, define it uh, and and uh, investigate its properties so definition definition of definite integral we were dealing uh, in all these previous problems which I have suggested with basically the same thing if you have some kind of function smooth function continuous differentiable maybe defined on segment AD and we are talking about real functions so this is a real argument and real function um, and then we have introduced a process on each step what we do we divide our uh, segment AB into different intervals I'm using time but it's actually X in this case so X0, X1, etc, Xn so this is A and this is B and you have N uh, intervals in between now, on each step, we calculate a sum and then we do this process of making our intervals smaller and smaller by increasing the number of intervals and making sure that the maximum interval uh, the the widest interval is still converging by lengths to zero so we introduce the limit so I will put n is, uh, is converging to infinity and maximum of delta xi goes to zero now this is usually abbreviated as delta xi now what's very important and I actually uh, talked about this in the first lecture when we were talking about area under curve we talked about that no matter how we divide our uh, segment AB into different intervals you can divide into equal intervals maybe not exactly equal maybe every odd equal uh, interval is equal to another odd interval and even intervals where uh, equal by themselves whatever the way as long as the maximum interval maximum by length interval is um, going uh, is, is becoming shorter and shorter down to zero which obviously necessitates that the number of intervals should be converging to infinity so uh, as long as this condition is satisfied the limit exists for our function f and it's unique no matter how you approach this particular process so for example what you can do is divide this interval a b by half on the first step on the second step you divide each half by half so basically getting four different intervals then again divide by half all intervals you will have eight intervals so obviously our condition is satisfied the largest interval is shrinking to zero the number of intervals obviously is going to infinity and the particular um, calculations in, in in limit will actually result in some kind of a number for each function f we choose relatively smooth function f we're talking about smooth function um, now somebody else might decide it differently okay I will define it in three different pieces this interval equal pieces and then each 
one third I divide again in three pieces so I will have nine intervals and then 27 etc well it's a different process but in the limit result will be exactly the same so existence of this limit and its uniqueness allows us to say okay this is some entity some number if you wish which depends only on function f and the segment where it is uh, defined and that's why i can call this thing an integral a definite integral from function f of x from a to b and this is the symbolics of this the sign of integral exactly the same by the way as for indefinite integrals and we will talk about why we have the same word integral used in both cases one is called indefinite integral and another is called this one is called definite integral they seem to have absolutely nothing in common right so if you remember indefinite integral it's basically anti-derivative it's the new function derivative of which is equal to original function right and this has something to do with these sums which doesn't seem to be related in any way and yet we are using the same symbol just put a couple of um, limits the lower limit and the upper limit of integration okay so we will touch this particular um, topic in the future right now you can just consider this to be just a symbol symbol which um, basically tells us the way how we come up with this thing this is the way how we come up we think about certain process of making our interval uh, our segment a b consisting of intervals of lower uh, of smaller and smaller size and in the limit we have something and that something is called integral of the function f of x in the limits from a to b so the definition is there the definition makes sense because of uniqueness and existence of this particular limit on the left of this formula now i actually calculated a couple of times the area under curve using this particular technique if you remember it's one of the i think it was the second lecture um, about definite integrals so we can definitely do this we can calculate our integral using this technique but nobody is doing it right now this way <laughs> and um, the way how to properly address this again i will talk about this in different um, um, a different time different lecture will be um, for today I would like to concentrate only on the definition of this and elementary properties All right so let's talk about properties now so there are certain obvious properties of the is of this integral property number one if you will take integral of two functions sum together it's, in, uh, it's equal to sum of their integrals now why is that well obviously because if this is not just f but f plus g then I can multiply them separately by uh, x i minus x uh, i minus one sum uh, of sums will be again sum of sums and limit of sum is equal to sum of limit so basically all the known properties of the summation and uh, and uh, and limits will be elementary used in this particular case to prove this this formula so i'm not really talking about certain things which i consider to be really trivial um and uh, so let's not just you know waste our precious time on this now here is a little bit more interesting example what 
what if I will integrate not from A to B, but from B to A? Well, first of all, what does it mean? Well, it means basically that x0 is B and xn is A. So if A is less than B, all these will be negative, right? So the correct uh, relation is this one, because these values will be the same, no matter how we go, from left to right or from right to left. But if we go from right to left, we start from x0 equal to b and finish xn equal to a, then all these would be negative, right? Because xi would be uh, smaller than xi minus 1. And that's why I have to uh, put the minus here. So if I change the limits of integration, it means I'm changing these delta xi's by sign, that's change by sign only, from, from positive to negative. And that's why integral from A to B and integral from B to A related to each other just by this minus sign. This is something which you might not really expect. But it's very, again, it's a very simple property. Now, next property is the following. What if you integrate from A to A. Which means our segment AB has zero lengths. Well, obviously, all Xi's would be uh, the same. They're all equal to each other. So all these would be zero. Sum will be equal to zero and limit will be equal to zero. Obviously, right? So integration from A to A uh, would result in zero. Next again is a little bit more trivial, I would say. If you have some kind of a multiplier, constant multiplier, what happens here? Well, if this is a constant multiplier, then obviously it presents itself here. You can always uh, take it, factor it out from the sum, and obviously you can take it uh, out from the limit, because the limit of multiplier by some variable, you can uh, put the multipl multiplier in front of the limit. So again, trivial properties of uh, summation and going to a limit result in this. This is trivial. Next. Next is interesting. Let's consider our function. on a segment from A to B. Now this is the minimum and this is its maximum. So, if we assume that A is less than B, trivial case, right? Um, and uh, let's just consider everything is positive everywhere, like, like here then obviously you can say that function f of x is greater than its minimum but smaller than its maximum, right? Which means that the whole thing would always be less than or equal to if I will replace this with m, capital M, maximum, which results in times what? If this is m and it's out, I have only sum of these, right? Now sum of these are sum of these individual intervals, which is actually 
the length of the entire segment, right? This plus this plus this plus this gives you an entire segment. Now, if you would like to introduce some, I would say, weird cases, like for instance, A is not less than B, then you can't really put something like this, you need to put absolute value. But this is something which is not really important. What's important is that it's less than certain constant multiplied by B minus A in the normal case when A is less than B, when it's a kind of a typical segment. Now, when it's really uh, true, it's true whenever the maximum exists, right? But we have assumed from the very beginning that our function f of x is smooth function on a segment from A to B, which means at least it's continuous, and if it's continuous, it reaches its maximum and minimum on this segment, right? We are not talking about functions like, for instance, uh, I don't know, tangent x, which goes to infinity at d over 2, right? We are not talking about this. Because then, this integral, which includes this as a right boundary, we are not considering this. We are considering only functions which are smooth on the uh, segment with both boundaries, so they reach its minimum and its maximum. And obviously, the next property, which is completely similar to this one, is that it's greater than lowercase m, which is minimum, right? Because again, if this is greater, f at xi is greater than minimum, then the whole thing is greater than uh, lowercase m multiplied by this, and we take it, factor it out from the sigma, and we have the length of the b minus a. So these are, again, two very simple uh, properties of the, uh, of the definite integral. And now I will have something which is not exactly obvious, but very, very important. Well, it's kind of obvious. Look at this this way. If you again consider integral as the area under curve and you divide it in two different pieces, like this is A, B, and C. Now, area from A to C obviously is equal to area from A to B plus area from B to C, right? It's an additive kind of a measure, this area thing is, right? So we are assuming the following to be true. Right? Now, how to prove it? Well, to prove it is really kind of simple. Let's consider A, B, and C are in this particular order. Right? A less than B, B is less than C. Now, any partitioning from A to C obviously uh, results in certain partitioning from A to B and then from B to C, right? So this particular uh, sum can always be represented as sum from certain number from, let's say, x0 to x, uh, let's say, 100, and then from x100 to x200, right? So the sum from, uh, from 1 to 200 is equal to sum from 1 to 100 plus from 101 to, to 200. So that's basically the way how you approach this. So for, 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 for any particular partitioning, you just uh, represent this function, this sigma, as a sum of two sigmas. One sigma from one to, let's say, some number k, and then from number k plus one to number n. One represents this, another represents that, and that's why you're basically proving that sum of these is equal to sum of these two integrals is equal to one total integral. Again, on area is very simple. On some other examples, like for instance, if you're covering the distance, 
uh, going into in the car. Obviously, if you have the time period from A to C, and you cover certain distance, uh, time B is somewhere in between. Then obviously your total distance from A to C is equal to distance from A to B plus distance from B to C. So it's kind of obvious on the intuitive level. Um, that's probably a very important uh, property which I will use when I will establish the connection between definite and indefinite integrals. So, basically these are the most important properties of integral. Some of them absolutely trivial, some of them not exactly trivial, but intuitively obvious, like from this particular example. And by the way, you always can think about uh, definite integral as area under curve. If you intuitively think about this this way, then you will obviously understand that all these properties are obvious. For instance, if you multiply function k by a factor of 3, for instance, so it will be somewhere here, then obviously this area would be 3 times as much as this. So that's why you kind of decide that the multiplier can be taken out from the integral. All right, that's it for today. Uh, I do suggest you to go to unisor.com and uh, uh, take a look at the notes for these lectures. Other than that, that's it. Thanks and uh, good luck.